All right, then you can go up, over all the way to the wall. Uh, it doesn't match. Go all the way in the end and pick it up. There you go, right there. Pick it right up. Yeah, pick it right up until it matches. Yeah, he's good. You flush on the bottom. In this video, we're going to be installing a temporary radiant heat system. So what we're going to do is use an electric tankless heater just to power it for now because if you've been watching my videos, you know that I'm going to have a geothermal system. The unit's going to sit right there actually, but, but for right now, we're going to hook up a little tiny electric tankless heater and we're just going to hook up this set of pipes for the basement. That's going to be for my first floor, so we don't need to hook that up. So right off the bat, I want to stay as far as I can away from the electric panel. There really is no code about that, but it's a good practice to stay as far as I can. So I'm going to try to put the manifold right here, and then I'm going to put my electric tankless heater right here. And then later on, when I get things hooked up the right way with the geothermal system, I'll hook this up into here, and all this will, will take over that spot. So then I'll have a bunch of manifolds and stuff right here afterwards. But for right now, we can put the tankless heater there just because it's temporary. And then I'll have the geo unit over there with a few tanks and stuff like that. So we'll leave this part over to the right, kind of blank for now. I have my incoming water right here, so we'll, we'll try to go up and over with that a little bit. The whole idea behind this system is to use something that's temporary for now, but not going to be a waste later. So everything that I'm using here, I didn't buy anything really to hook up this system that I don't already need for my snow melt system. So eventually all the equipment that I'm gonna be installing right now is gonna be used for my snow melt system. So it's gonna be hooked up to different pipes when I'm done and it's gonna be moved over, probably over here will be its permanent location. And then that will be a separate system than the geothermal and I'll have glycol in that so that it can't freeze. And I'll just use that little tankless heater for that and as well as all the fittings and all the different things for that. So nothing that I'm installing here is something that I'm going to be wasting and just throwing away or never using again. It's all going to be used again. That was the whole purpose behind this was the fact that I knew I already had to buy this stuff. So for now I can install it and then I'll just kind of switch it around later. So this is what the ceiling looks like in here after we take out all the bracing and stuff. So. We will be doing that to the rest of this basement pretty soon here, but for right now I don't really need to bother with that. So by code you need a 15 minute thermal barrier and plywood counts as a thermal barrier. Um, not all jurisdictions accept that, so you got to kind of check, but most of them do. You can use half inch sheetrock, but I don't want to use any sheetrock in here because there's going to be like, there could be water and moisture and stuff, so I don't want to deal with anything like that. So you really got to put this plywood behind everything before you start installing things on the wall. So that's why I put this here. This is a blonde wood. This is poplar. And this was the cheapest like finished grade plywood that I could find that was three quarters of an inch thick. It was $57 a sheet, which right now isn't crazy expensive. I'm going to install it so the thermostat just turns on the pump and we're going to put a three port manifold in because I got three loops, but it's only going to be one zone. So this should be nice and simple. We'll set it up pretty quick. I'll use my incoming water. I'll hook that up over in the pump house. That way I can feed the whole system and not have to purge it manually. That way I can have pressure behind my purge water and I don't have to use like a pump and a garden hose or something.
I decided to make a few changes here. I didn't like the tankless heater being underneath of that beam. Right above it is a cold joint on the floor and there's a crack there because it's a cold joint. So I don't want any water to be dripping down. It's not dripping down right now, but it could when it warms up and everything thaws out. So I just decided to put the tankless heater over here instead. And what I'm gonna do is switch these over so that this valve right here is over here and this drain port is over here. That way it can return right out of the tankless right into this side. But I'm still gonna feed the manifold from this side. And I'm gonna put the expansion tank right here and the pump right here. I'm kind of kicking myself for not getting the rotational flange. It's an adjustable flange on these isolator valves. It means so you can put them in any direction and keep the pump the way it is. That would have been really nice. I think I tried to order them, but they were out of them or something. Probably should have just checked that local plumbing supply. I probably could have got them, but I didn't really want this handle on the bottom and I wanted this more towards the top, but whatever, this, this will work.
It looks a little bit weird with these valves on opposite sides like this, but it'll work, so that's all that matters. All right, so, all right, so a lot of you are probably wondering why I'm reducing everything down to half inch. And the reason is because this tankless heater only provides half inch inlets and outlets. So there's no point in going three quarter with anything else because everything has to go through this heater. So if there's a choke point of half inch right there, there's just no need to make anything else three quarters or even one inch. Like a lot of this stuff is one inch. This air scoop right here is one inch these are one inch coming out of these manifolds so i'm reducing everything down to half inch i've heard people say that you can get like eight gallons a minute out of half inch pecs i don't know if you can really get that much or not but as long as we can get one gallon a minute or even close to one gallon a minute for each loop so that's three gallons a minute all together then we'll be fine ideally it would have been really nice to have that at three quarter then everything else could be three quarter but we're working with what we got and I'm pretty confident that this will work, but we'll see. I think the name of the game with this system is gonna be slow and low. So, you know, low circulation, low temperatures, low flow, but it keeps on for a while. I think that's gonna be the name of the game with this. This is about 8,000 watts if you put 10 gauge wire into it. If you put eight gauge, you can actually go up to 10,000 watts, so 10K. But I'm just gonna hook it up with 10 gauge wire. I don't think I need the extra little bit of heat in it. The whole idea behind this is that little heater is not an impressive little heater, but it should work because every time you bring the loop back around, as long as it heats at like five or 10 degrees, that's all that really needs to happen. So if that loop starts out at 50 degrees, it comes back around, you know, you got about 300 feet of loop or a little less. And if we're traveling at one gallon a minute, there's about three gallons of fluid in each loop. And so every three minutes, that water should be circulating back. So if I can start out at 50 degrees and I circulate it and in three minutes it's 55 degrees and then in three minutes it's 60 degrees and it just keeps going like that, then eventually it'll get up to about 90, which I think is what I'm gonna be running at. And then it'll just maintain it and then at that point, whatever the delta is, that's all that it needs to heat that every time it goes around. So this is not gonna be like the ideal heating system for everybody. This is just like pure temporary and it's kind of experimental. And we're gonna see if this works because everything's reduced down to half inch. But I'm really confident that it will. It'll just take a little bit longer to heat up, but that's not a problem. Radiant heat is not fast anyways. But I'll get into more of those details in a minute. I think at this point I'm ready to start hooking up my PEX. I got everything adapted to PEX. This is a backflow preventer as well as it's a pressure valve. So this automatically sends whatever pressure you have it set at into the whole system and it keeps it at that pressure. And so I'm gonna set it at 15 pounds. So this is just hooked up to the domestic water, the cold outlet. 
and then it just basically shoots water in when it needs to. Basically the water is going to travel this way and as it does this air scoop takes all the air, brings it up top and goes out this air vent and then it circulates into the manifold, back into the slab and back into this return and then this goes straight into here. All right, so on the other end of that, I already have a well installed and I have a pump house, so I just hooked that up. So now we can go ahead and turn this on. So we're right about 16 PSI right now. Nothing's really open yet though, so we can't see if anything leaks. So I'm going to take and open one thing at a time. So right now I'm not trying to turn the pump on yet, I just want to see if anything leaks with 15 PSI. So far so good. These are closed, so it's not going to go in the loops yet. Alright, so I don't see any leaks, so now I'm going to hook up the electric to this pump, and then we can try out just circulating everything around, and then the last thing we'll do is power up the tankless water heater. So this is what they call an ECM pump, and that means it's electronically controlled. And basically what that means is it has a computer chip in it, and basically what it does is it senses how much flow it needs, and it only uses what it needs and then it doesn't do any more or any less.
All right, so just to test this out, I got these two wires crossed over instead of having a thermostat there. I'll install that later. But we're ready to test this out. So let's turn back on this water. And flip that on. Okay. So I think this pump has like a purge mode. I'm gonna turn up this pressure a little bit. Turn that up to 12. So I'm getting all different kinds of lights here. I don't really know a lot about this pump, but and I think this said it does up to 13 gallons a minute. That's way more than we need. I definitely don't want to turn on that heater until all the air is out. As soon as that flow meter starts working, that's when you know you got most of the air out. So it's not working yet. It'll go down the more flow it has. This is definitely getting all the air out though. If you put a light behind this pipe, you can see all the bubbles coming out. All right guys, so last night it was the perfect night to test this new system out because it was negative four degrees. I think that's the coldest day we've had all year. It might be the coldest day we have for the rest of the year too. So I got this all hooked up now and it's working really good. I got the thermostat set on 63 and it's 63. So everything's working good. Right now I have this water heater set on 95 degrees. You can see that I can go all the way up to 140 if I want or down to 86. I'm just trying it out at 95 right now and you can see my water going into the loops is indeed 95. Coming out of the loops, we're looking at about 75, 74. So the Delta T is pretty high right now, 20 degrees is pretty high. Um, and that's because I have low flow. So you can see I got about 0.4 gallons per minute on each loop, which is pretty low. I was thinking it should be between three quarters and one gallon a minute on each loop. Um, this pump isn't pumping out any more than this. It has more speeds, but it's just not kicking them on for some reason. I think what it's doing is it's sensing all the flow restrictions because of these half inch fittings. That's kind of the choke point of everything. And this is purely temporary, so to me it doesn't matter and I'm probably not going to change it, it's not even worth it. But I think what I could have done is go from half inch to three quarters right here at the heater. And I think by doing that, I could get more flow because I'm eliminating any of these restrictions right here. Like these fittings are where it's restricted. The pipe itself is wider than the fittings, but these fittings are only like a quarter inch diameter on the inside, maybe like five sixteenths. I actually had these flow meters on the return before and I didn't realize that they don't work like that so I switched these up. That's what's cool about these manifolds. Like this is exactly the same one as that so all I had to do is unscrew these pieces here and these pieces here and swap them and they have like little rubber o-rings in them. So it was really easy to switch those up. So I was heating this whole basement with a space heater set on low and that's 750 watts. So my theory behind this whole thing is, yes, that's very small, but it actually packs quite a bit of a punch. This is 7,200 watts. So it's nearly 10 times the power that I was putting in here before. 
So if I can heat this with just, I was heating it up to like 53 degrees with just that 750 watts. So if I can do that, then if I have almost 10 times that power, then I knew that it would work. It was just gonna be slow and low. It was just gonna take a while, that's all. This thing, you can actually tell when it's maxing out its power. Right now it's modulating, the light is on. But if you turn it up enough, it'll start blinking and that's when it can't keep up. So right now I'm set at 120, but anything more than that and it's just too much for it. And then it will actually be less than what you're set at. See, so now even at 120, it's blinking, which means that the water coming out is less than 120. It's probably only a little bit less. Like if I put it down to 115, then it's fine. But you can see how much heat I have. Like I'm all the way turned down to 95, but I could turn it all the way up to 120. So if it's blinking, that means that it's maxed out full power and it just can't quite keep up. But that's okay, I don't need it anywhere near that. Like 95, 100 is good. And remember, I'm only using 10 gauge wire, so I have the jumper set on 7200 watts right now. If I ran 8 gauge wire instead of 10 gauge wire, I could actually bump this up to, I think it's 9.6K, so 9600 watts, which I could have done and get a little bit more power out of it, but there's no need. Right now, with the water coming back into the heater at 75, it easily heats it up to 95. It's almost nothing for this heater. So this is that little thermal imager that I got. I'm gonna plug this in my phone and show you what's going on here. So there's the whole system right there. Notice that the walls don't have any thermal bridging at all. That's what makes this system able to heat up so efficiently, is also having an efficient structure too. That really helps. It's really neat how you can see every pipe in the floor. Look how warm that floor is. You can't really see it, but that says it's about 75 degrees right now. That's the temperature of the floor. So you can see around the outside that it's a little bit colder. That's because I didn't put heating over top of the footings. Probably would change that next time, but it'll be fine. But look at all this heating. The darker and bluer it is, the colder and then the brighter it is the warmer and one thing that makes a huge difference is the fact that I was running that loop over there there's three loops in here I was running that loop first for a while and then I purged the air out of this one because you got to purge each loop at a time. So I did that one first and then I did this one and then I did the one over there. So it kind of corresponds with what you're seeing right now because this floor is hotter and this floor is the next hot one and then that one's the coldest. And as you're moving it around, it like adjusts the temperature and calibrates the colors. And then you can see my footing here for this post. That doesn't have the radiant heat on it. I didn't want the heat going through that footing. But, you know, there's going to be a door right there. So that's all going to be part of the utility room. And I purposely didn't put the loops any longer than I had to in the utility room because I knew it was going to get hot in here. So there's no loops like anywhere is over on the sides or over by the electric panel over there. But the heat coming out of the exposed lines is enough that it's actually going to heat this room quite a bit more than any other room. But look at those loops, how you can see every little detail. 
I thought that was really neat just seeing that. Because if you needed to drill something in the floor, you could. You could locate the pipes by doing this and then you could drill into the floor. I don't really have a reason to, but let's talk about the flow rate. So you can see this loop right here, all the way over next to the blue, it's really hot and then it gets colder as it goes here until right there and that's the new loop. And so the reason that is is because the start of the loop is over there and then the end of it is here. So because I have low flow, there's quite a bit of difference between them. But this structure right here is just under 900 square feet and I'm heating this with this little 7200 watt heater. I personally think you could get away with a three or 4000 watt heater. It might be running all the time, but you could definitely do that on probably 12 gauge wire, 240 volt. But how cool is it that I have this structure now that's totally waterproof, insulated, heated, and just out of the weather in general, just in time for when I need it. Like how cool is that that I can pretty much, I could live in there if I wanted to. If I ran out of money and I couldn't do anything more, I could live in this just the way it is right now. I could just stop building and live in it. I've lived in a lot less than 900 square feet before. And a lot of people live in that kind of space their whole life. I'm gonna have two more levels to this. I didn't have to do anything differently than what I was already gonna do and I could live in here. Over top of me right now is like R30 or R38 or something like that. I can't remember. Each build block has different R value. This is a 12 inch build block. If you were out in the middle of nowhere and you had nowhere to live and you wanted to build a house and you were like living in a camper or something, you could just get this far and then you could live inside of this structure while you're building the rest of it. Let me just give you a rundown of like what everything costs just very briefly. This switching relay has $60. This was $250. You know, this stuff is like nothing. This manifold was like, I think it was a little under $200. This pump was $150. This stuff was like nothing. This is like $100 right here. And then this is like, I don't know, $80 or something. So what's that, like $500 altogether? So if I had to pay $500 for all this stuff just to heat this for one year until I get the geothermal, I probably wouldn't have done it. But the whole idea behind it was that I could reuse everything here for the snow melting. So there was no reason why I couldn't get it. And as a matter of fact, it was better that I got it now because the prices of things keep going up anyways. So this is a fun little experiment. This is only my second radiant heat system. My first one was in my other house and you guys can see that video. It's a few months back. And so then we'll hook up the geothermal system next year, you know, well in time before the winter hits. And by that time, I should actually have everything built all the way up to the roof. So we can actually start using the snow melt system and all that stuff next year around this time. So the next video we're going to do on this project is going to be tearing down all of this bracing. And as soon as I tear all these down, then I can start installing my electric. I can start putting outlets in the walls, switches in the walls, and I can start putting some lighting i'm going to put some can lights in here or recess lights and i got kind of a little bit of an experiment with that because it's going to go in this foam so that's going to be in the next video for this house and then soon i should get to that bathroom and start doing that too so and then my order should come in for more icfs in march so then i can continue on which is perfect because that's like in the spring and everything's thawed out. So then I can start building more upward. So I'll see you guys on the next video.